ants uh, and ant uh, social behavior and such, and then eventually became a psychiatrist, a leading psychiatrist in the world, and became uh, one of the leading figures in the eugenics movement, <coughs> winning over one of some of the main uh, German eugenicists. <coughs> Uh, there were also many others uh, in the Darwinian camp who were struggling against uh, the idea of body-soul dualism. Ernst Haeckel, whom I've mentioned a number of times already, in 1906 founded an organization called the Monist League. And he called his philosophy monism. And what that was meant to do was be a direct uh, contradiction to dualism. And he fought against any kinds of dualism. Judeo-Christian most prominently, since that was the most uh, prominent worldview around in his day, but also against Kantian dualism, any kind of dualism uh, he was opposed to. And uh, he believed that his Darwinian outlook had destroyed the notion that there could be any kind of a human soul separate from uh, the body. Okay, fifth point. Uh, the human struggle for existence. This was another key aspect of Darwinian thinking that was going to have big implications uh, for the value of human life. Darwin had explained that uh, as, multi as uh, organisms multiply, they multiply far faster than they can survive. Uh, and this imbalance, which was based on uh, Malthus population principle, Malthus had been a, a thinker who had posed the, a problem of, of the uh, super fecundity or the over reproduction of uh, species is, and Malthus focused specifically on humans. Uh, Darwin got his idea about struggle for existence and natural selection while reading Malthus and then had to explain this situation where you have all these uh, organisms being produced but not reaching reproductive age, which means there's mass death taking place throughout the biological world. And Malthus, of course, was specifically talking about human society, so certainly this is applying to humans uh, as well. Now, this idea of the human struggle for existence, competition for scarce resources, because there's more people reproducing than can possibly exist, according to Malthus and then also according to Darwin, could also take place on two levels, just like the inequality issue. It can take place, the struggle for existence can take place within a society. So people within a society, individuals, are having to struggle among themselves uh, and have scarce resources. So the way this worked itself out, here's a eugenics poster uh, from Germany. I think this was done during the Nazi period, in fact. And the title of it is The Threat of the Subhuman. And there on the top, you have uh, these, uh, this is a, a male criminal, it says. And the male criminal has 4.9 children. And then here you have a criminal marriage, it says, 4.4 children. Then here you have in this middle diagram, you have uh, parents uh, with uh, children in special education. Okay? And they have 3.5 children with them. And then down here you have the average German family. And they're having 2.2 children. And then here you have an academic family. Uh, and they only have 1.9 children. And the lesson is that in this struggle for existence, the wrong people are winning out. Uh, it's the, the criminals and the mentally, quote, substandard are the ones who are winning out in the struggle for existence. So we need to rectify this situation. Uh, and the eugenics was the way to try to rectify uh, this situation for many of these Darwinian thinkers. OK, uh, here's another one. Uh, it's not just Germany that this is going on. Here's one from the United States. Uh, this is a display that was uh, put in many uh, fairs throughout the United States. The Amer American Eugenics Society had booths at, at uh, county and state fairs throughout the United States in the early 20th century where they pushed for their ideas relating to population. And you see here on the left, it says some people are born to be a burden on the rest. And then here below it, it says America needs, and then it says less of these, and it has here on the left a light blinking. Uh, it says that light blinks every 48 seconds on the left. And it says every 48 seconds a person is born in the United States who will never grow up mentally beyond that stage of a normal eight-year-old boy or girl. Okay, So we need less of those. And then on the right side it says America needs more of these. 
And here you have a light flashing. It says this light flashes every seven and a half minutes. It says every seven and a half minutes, a high-grade person is born in the United States who will have ability to do creative work and be fit for leadership. About 4% of all Americans come within this class. Now, notice the disparity here. Okay, on the left, you have every 48 seconds. Here, it's only every seven and a half minutes. Again, this is designed to generate your fears of human degeneration that's going to take place uh, because more of these, quote, unfit people are being born than of the so-called fit. Okay, so again, a similar kind of idea. Notice again the inegalitarianism here, which we already talked about earlier, uh, people being a burden on the right, trying to figure out how to correct uh, these kind of problems <coughs> that they have. Okay, so that's within society. That's how the human struggle for existence would take place within society. But then human struggle for existence also takes place between societies. Uh, here's a uh, diagram from a book by a man named Friedrich Helwald, who was a uh, prominent German ethnologist who uh, wrote a book called uh, cult The History of Culture. Uh, this is from the fourth edition in 1896. Uh, his first edition was in the 1870s. Uh, and he was uh, highly regarded by uh, his colleagues. Uh, but his whole account of the history of culture is an attempt to try to show how the Darwinian struggle for existence applies to human history. And this he gives as one example. And he says in the text that this is an example of the human struggle for existence. The Spaniards up here are letting their dogs loose on the American Indians. And Helvalt says, this is just a natural process that takes place. It's just part of the human struggle for existence. Uh, and so thus justifies this kind of scene as he depicts it here. Now, Helvot was not the only one to put forward ideas similar to this. In fact, Darwin himself put forward ideas about racial extermination. Darwin wrote to a colleague saying that, quote, the more civilized so-called Caucasian races <coughs> 